ladies. Okay, listen, I'm just gonna level with you. Have either of you ever seen a black girl win one of these shows? Has one even made it into the final four? Twice in 13 seasons, but there's only one way they make it. Don't say far. what I think you're about to say. Honey, believe me, it pains my black soul, but you deserve the truth. Omarosa, Nene Leaks, and you've got to go big, okay, loud and highly opinionated. I didn't go to Spelman and clerk for Supreme Court Justice to end up some ratchet hoochie on TV. I deserve to be here. I, I want to be in the final four because of who I am. I Hell. I just want people to know my name. So when I open my hair shop, there'll be a line around the block. Athena it is. Stay classy. You come with me, please. We've got some work to do, girl. So exciting. I am so excited to be here with one of my dearest friends, a model Canadian. You're the so sweet. handsomest person that I know. Oh, um, come on. I'll take you, it. Well, <laughs> I was just thinking about you guys just, for Unreal, you just won a Peabody. How major was that? It's insane, isn't it? I don't think any of us saw it coming. I think that it was one of the greatest achievements that we could have ever dreamed of on this show. I think what's so special about the Peabody specifically um, is that they really just focus on thoughtful, impactful stories. Um, and the fact that we have done something of such incredible quality that could be considered, um, you know, uh, even you know, viable to be nominated for such an ex a prestigious uh, award was was. A, and it sounds like such gift. high culture for a television it show. It does. Right, a television it? show that's largely about pulling the curtain behind a reality production, right? How did it feel to reunite for season two, knowing all of this acclaim was there with your castmates on set? You know, we're so far removed from, um, we shoot up in Vancouver, so we're so far from, removed from like New York and Los Angeles and the entertainment industry that we're all so in it. We're still shooting season two right now. We're just on episode eight right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, the, our sole focus really is just on the story and telling the story. All of us love each other so genuinely as a cast, so it just feels like you know reuniting with family in many ways. Um, we're just really, really excited to see what we have, for you guys to see what we've cooked up for you this season, because it's just so much bigger and badder and darker and funnier this season than you can even imagine. We're gonna break down all of season two. I wonder how, as an actor and as a cast, does it, sh so the first time you made the, the first season, it was like a year's process, right? You were part of the first pilot and then yeah. the the redone pilot. Oh, you know and, all the details. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> and this time it, it, it's different, right? Because you come with knowing the it's been out in the world and people yes. have seen it and received it and applaud it. Does it shift the way in which you work. Oh, absolutely, without question. I feel like I know Jay so much more on such a deeper level. I feel like I live in his skin now. In the original pilot, when we did it in 2013 in Atlanta, Jay was straight, actually. And I, uh, I booked the role, and I loved the character and loved the show. We shot the pilot, and then the co-creator of the show, Marty Knoxon, called me and uh, said they were- Of Buffy they were, fame, right? Of Buffy fame, Marty Knoxon. <laughs> I grew up obsessed with Marty Knoxon. She's just such a phenomenal storyteller. Um, she told me that she wanted to rewrite the character of Jay and make him gay and write him after me, which was just such a tremendous gift. So I thought it was going to be like a total breeze going into season one, being like, oh, they're just writing him after me. And then I see all of these like horribly manipulative and dark things that Jay <laughs> is doing. And I'm like, I, you know, this is nothing like me at all. So it took a minute to find my stride with him. Um, but this season, the, char or the writers have just done such a phenomenal job of really developing him, not only as a character, but as like a three-dimensional human being. He is uh, like a thoughtful, well-written, compassionate gay man on television, and the fact that his storyline doesn't center around, or is not, the focal point is not his sexuality, is just such a blessing, and I feel like it's a real rarity on television today to have a gay lead character on a television series where the fact that his that the fact that he's gay isn't even ever mentioned so but far. He's not the season. center of the hot mess that's going on in terms of the production exactly. of, un, of of everlasting. Exactly. So you know for, for Jay he is tall tall, dark, <laughs> handsome. Jay or Jeffrey? Jay <laughs> Well, you're not manipulative. You're one of the oh, sweetest people that I know. Thanks, Jeff. So, you know, we just saw that clip where he's speaking to the, the two black contestants on this show that's largely centered around whiteness and white love. How was it for you to deliver that line, those lines that largely was telling these young women, these contestants on this show to take on the angry black woman kind of myth? and stereotype. Um, you know what's so funny? I, I, am, I am so grateful, but very surprised that that storyline um, was so impactful and caught on 
the way that it did. Um, I mean, we kind of breezed over that storyline, the, the whole race storyline and racial dynamics in not only the entertainment industry, but specifically reality television. Um, we, we, we covered it in that episode, which was episode two of the first season, but it was just kind of a setup for the, the entirety of season two, where we have a black suitor, and we have uh, far more black contestants, and um, we really get to we we get to dig deep into that storyline. The first season, um, that scene specifically, I loved. I loved that scene, and I loved that storyline. I loved those two actors, but I was really grateful for the fact that Jay was somebody who um, wasn't willing to uh, um, manipulate these contestants without their knowledge. He was fully letting them in on the story. Yeah, I never thought about that. That is actually a powerful. Piece to Absolutely, yeah. he's he was their ally in many ways. He just he laid it flat out for them and said, "Look, if you want if you want to get ahead in this game, this is the way that you have to play it. Which one of you is willing to do so?" And then you know, and it didn't it didn't work. Unfortunately, they both played that game, but it didn't get any of them ahead at the end of the day. The show has never been um, afraid to take on very controversial and hot topics, right? Yeah. You think about the sense of mental illness and mental illness and suicide. A character, one of the main characters, being in the closet. Um, domestic violence. And so in the next season, with the casting of BJ Britt as the new suitor on, yes, on, on Everlasting, <laughs> how um, how spot on and unafraid are, is the unreal storyline going to be around centering race in this space? Well, um, so it's it's funny because the, the main storyline of this season obviously does center around race. We have a black suitor, which had never been done on 14 seasons of Everlasting and has never been done on any reality dating competition program. So in, in that sense, it's very groundbreaking. Um, something that I came to realize very quickly a couple of episodes in is that it's as major as it was for the first for the first episode and the network on Everlasting having, having such major problems with um, the fact that we've cast a black, a black suitor, it, we normalize it very quickly. There's really no difference between having a black suitor and a white suitor. He's a human being who's there to um, rehabilitate his image, who's looking for love, not only from the contestants, but also from America uh, you know, at large. He's looking for acceptance and looking for uh, validation. Um, he has made some mistakes in the past and he's looking to um, for, for, the, for the rest of the world to look to him and say, it's okay, you're okay just as you are, and we love you, you know? Yeah, uh, I was thinking in terms of the casting of him, it, I wonder if that is part of the commentary, right? Because what Unreal World does so well is that it kind of lets all of us know the production of Bachelor, right? It's speaking to the cultural existence of this show that millions of people watch on right. the network, right? The fact that they then decided to cast BJ Britt in this role, it has to shift the dynamics of what the producers are, are must be saying to one another behind this. I know you probably can't give too much away to us. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a, there's a, many different ways that we can go while telling this story. Um, I feel like Jay specifically is um, adamant in continuing the storyline from last season and really letting the contestants in on um, what's going on behind the scenes. He really wants to protect them and to lift them up and to uh, portray who they are authentically and uh, it, to the rest of the world, to tell their story in a really beautiful and thoughtful way. Um, he is wanting to do that with the character of Darius Hill, played by BJ Bread as well. Um, and he's constantly fighting against it with the other producers because the network is scared that they have a black suitor. They're scared that he is going to be too black. They're scared that he's going to be um, not black enough. Um, they're scared that, um, you know, for, for many, many reasons when it comes to advertising or, you know, uh, network ratings and things like that. Um, so their, the, his counterparts, Rachel and Quinn and Chet this season are really vying for um, the exact opposite story that Jay wants to tell. They want to tell the story that, of you know the stereotypical um, black man and the and the and the black contestants in a, in a way that isn't necessarily sh uh, shining uh, shining a, a positive light on on them. And as for Jay this season, is he going to get love? Does he have an everlasting storyline? Is there any kind of romance going on? Because the one thing that I often feel too, right, the, the fact that you know Jay is this character that kind of happens to be gay, or he's a producer that happens to be gay. Yeah. I also fear sometimes around the desexualization of, right, the fact that yes. there's no romance for these characters. They're just kind of like, 
I'm just here, you yes. know? And so does that, is that explored at all in season two? Um, can you tell he, Yeah, yeah, no, uh, the, the, the writers of the show called me and, and uh, at the beginning of the season and told me that they were, there would potentially be a love storyline for Jay. And then as the season progressed, um, we just all kind of agreed that it was too soon mm. um, for uh, who they were specifically looking at to be Jay's, uh, Jay's love interest. They've brought it up again to me recently, actually just last week, they thought by episode 10, which we're gonna be going into in a couple of weeks, that we could potentially jump into that storyline, but we'll see. Jay is so focused solely on, um, you know, doing, not only doing a good job and making thoughtful, impactful television, but really like breaking through that glass ceiling and rising to the top this season, that love is kind of the last thing on his mind, but we'll see. So is that part of, is that Jay's ultimate goal as, as you play him? Is, mm -hmm. For you, is it like you're thinking that he wants to be the top producer on one of these shows or to have his own show? What is his internal drive and focus? Yeah, he's definitely power hungry. He is, I feel like uh, like the, the main storyline or the main motivation for all of the characters on this show is getting what you want by any means necessary. Um, he's wanting to go about it in a way that he doesn't throw his contestants under the bus or um, you know, compromise his integrity on a daily basis. He's surrounded by this world of such extreme manipulation and darkness and lies and chaos and drama. He's in it, but he's not of it. He sees it and he can't uh, help be, but be affected by it. But in many ways, I feel like Jay is the moral compass of this show. Um, he sees these horrible things going on all around him all day, every day, um, and he feels bad about it. I think it's really interesting to look at the world of Everlasting through Jay's eyes. He's wanting to get to the top and to become a power producer, to have his own show, potentially host his own show, um, make, make in, important, impactful television, but he's not willing to go about it in the way that he sees Rachel and Quinn doing it. Um, so I think that's a really interesting story that we're playing. Like, how, like w does the nice guy finish last, essentially? I don't think he does. I think that you get far farther in, li in, in life in general and, and in your professional life by, by being a good guy. And in terms of important and impactful television, as you said, how, you know, your character, Jay, is one of the few, I would say, you know, when you're talking about intersectional um, representations of blackness and gayness and how that all exists in one, in one body and one person. How does it feel to be a part of this current, you know, there's Jesse Smollett, who I know is a good friend of yours on Empire. How does it, how do you feel around the whole um, representation of black gay men in television? Um, well, I mean, I can only speak for myself. I think it's my dream come true. It's everything that I've ever wanted and everything I ever aspired uh, towards my entire life. I mean, um, I was talking about it last night. I, uh, people ask me sometimes why, why did I want to become an actor? And my only answer is that I don't, I, I, I've always known that I would be an actor. From the time that I was a child watching television, I was just so, uh, uh, so enamored by that world, this world of make-believe and imagination in Hollywood. But when I would t tune into um, television and film as a child, I never saw anybody who looked like me. I never saw gay ca characters of color represented authentically or thoughtfully or pos in a positive light on television. Ever so, from a very young age, it just I, I I knew that I had to become that. Um, I think that it's very important to be telling the story, similar to uh, Jamal Lyons' story that played by Jesse Smollett on Empire. Um, what it is to be black and gay in the world of hip hop and the entertainment industry, um, the struggles of coming out, the struggles of strength of staying true to yourself. That's important, and that's a very relevant and timely discussion to have. Um, on the flip side, where it's not discussed, it's not Jay's main focal focal uh, focal point or storyline at all. His sexuality. Um, I think that's also a very very important story to tell to normalize it. Um, I think that people, uh, you know, gay people, you have, to, you have to come into yourself. And sometimes that takes longer for, for some people than others. Um, but Jay's gotten past that point. He's already, he's already come out. He's come out to his friends and his family. He is a gay man working in this world of reality television. And his story is like, what, what's, what's next? What now? How do I operate in the world and, um, you know, uh, and do a phenomenal job. And um, I think Unreal does a really good job of, of normalizing it, just kind of normalizing what it, is to be, what it is to be gay in 2016, which is a very important story to tell. Well, late last year, you spoke at HRC's um, gala, and yeah. you introduced yourself as an actor, feminist, humanitarian, ally of transgender men and women, and a gay man. Yeah. How has being visible and vocal affected your own space in terms of being a public person now? Um, uh, I mean, I feel it's to, to have, 
I mean, I've been out for as long as I can, I mean, 12 years old, I think, is when I, was when I came out to, to my friends initially. I've known I was gay since I was like three years old, so it's never really been an issue for me. It's been more of an issue to other people, um, unfortunately. Um, saying it out loud in a public platform like that was very powerful for me because I feel like I just, I never, uh, growing up, I saw uh, instances of, you know, uh, people like, Ellen DeGeneres is an example that I use, or Rupert Everett, people who were uh, public figures in the 90s and early 2000s who came out and didn't necessarily have the support um, that I have in 2016. Um, I saw the struggle and the, and the, the, the turmoil, the emotional, the emotional turmoil they were going through on a daily basis by, you know, hiding in the closet and then having to make this huge proclamation to the world, I am gay, and then having to wait for the backlash or the acceptance or whatever that is. I didn't ever want to go through that. I saw that what they went through, and I knew that for me it was just easier to just be out, you know, just to, it's been a very important thing for me to always play gay characters, um, to help normalize what it is to be gay in the entertainment industry. Um, getting up on that stage and saying it to the world, um, especially in such a phenomenal uh, community that was there that night in the HRC gala in Seattle, um, it was just, it was, a, it was a really beautiful affirmation that I, um, I have a beautiful, loving community of people around me who support me, who are like-minded individuals, um, and will help me on my path. And that's largely an activist space. Are you ever kind of, were you ever worried or torn in any kind of sense of having to step forward and make those kind of proclamations? I'm a feminist, I'm an activist, I'm a humanitarian. Did, did that fear, was that any fearful for you as an, as an artist? Um, no. Honestly, I feel like it would have been um, harder for me to not say anything, you know? Um, I think Maya Angelou said, um, one, of the, one of the saddest things in this world is an untold story, you know? If you don't speak from your, from, from your, from your heart's core, if you don't speak uh, to the world and let, let your soul's purpose be known, what is the point of living, really? I have this phenomenal opportunity and this gift, this platform that I've been given to be able to speak my truth and to be able to be what I didn't have when I was growing up and to be, um, you know, just, just visible, just visible as an out gay actor. I think that in itself is a very powerful thing. So if I were to not recognize the opportunities that I've been given and not take full, take full advantage of them and be incredibly grateful for them in the way that I am, I think that would be sadder or harder for me than getting up and, and proclaiming it. I am a humanitarian, I am a feminist, I am, you know, uh, I, I'm just me, I'm just Jeffrey. And that's, those are all just, those are just all shades of me. Okay, now you said feminist. Yes. So there's this, there's like this huge debate, I think conversations going on around what are men's place within the feminist movement? How do you feel about a lot of, a lot of very vocal, a lot of men taking up a lot of space when it comes to feminist conversations. We explore that this this season in in Unreal. Actually, we explore um, the the concept of the men's rights movement, which sounds absurd, but <laughs> uh, you can come to your own conclusions as to as to, as to as to what that means. The men's rights movement. Um, for me personally, I mean, uh, it's it's just about equality. It's about you know men and we're all human beings regardless of of race or gender or sexuality. Um, we're we we're we're the human race. So men and women having um, a, a, a different rights just seems absolutely absurd to me. Um, it's never really been you know proclaiming myself as a feminist is never it's that's not it just seems very natural to me. I've always had a huge affinity towards the feminine energy. Um, I was raised by my mother and three sisters. All of my closest friends have always been female. Um, the, the people who I've gone to advice in my life have always been female, whether they've been my agents or you or, you know, I mean, it's like, I, re I just, I really, really respect the, the feminine energy. I feel like uh, women have this really beautiful ability to um, create a safe space for you to authentically shine as who you are. And unfortunately, the men in my life, especially when I was growing up, didn't ever um, exhibit that type of behavior or make me feel safe just to be me. Um, so I feel like I'm a natural born feminist. But I also feel as if not only men, ha I mean, women have that special skill, I think that you also, do the same thing. You make a lot of people feel safe and comforted, and so I just want to thanks, point Janet. That out I as well. definitely embrace the feminine energy. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, before we before we turn to the audience, what is the last show that you binged? Ooh, I just finished watching um, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt season two. 
which I loved. I'm actually, I'm gonna tell you a couple shows that I just binged. Cause I've been up in Vancouver and I, you know, like on, when we're shooting nights and I, like I'm just, I'm trying to like, you know, stay awake in my trailer at three o'clock in the morning. I watched Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, just finished watching Girls season five. And then this is the one that's like, that's kind of embarrassing, but I have to admit it, Fuller House. It was so <laughs> well, bad yeah, slash good. That's it was your, really that's good. That's your largest applause was Fuller House. <laughs> So I think that you need to maybe speak about what Fuller House... I loved Fuller House. I grew up uh, loving Full House, specifically. I remember, I mean, I was probably three or four years old when Full House came out, and I remember the first episode and the, the theme music starting and me just, like, dancing around the living with my mother and my sister, you know... Uh, what is the theme? What is the theme music? What is it? Uh, do you want me to sing it? No, <laughs> Janet! <laughs> Don't make me sing. <laughs> yeah, I, can, I, I would, but I think it would embarrass all of us. Um, uh, uh, so I, I just, you know, watching Fuller House, it was just like a full, I mean, at times it was super cheesy for obvious reasons, but um, it was just like a full throwback to my childhood, which I nostalgia. appreciated so much. Yeah. Full on nostalgia. I loved it. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and also RuPaul's Drag Race. Obviously. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think it's now it's time to turn it to the audience. Hi, what's your name? My name is Afua. Afua, nice to meet you. You too. I wanted to know, since you finished filming season one and now you're filming season two, has your view on reality TV changed and the way it portrays um, minority groups? Um, yes, I've realized that, um, that uh, minority groups need allies in the world of, of reality television. Um, I feel like it's a really powerful thing to play a character like Jay who sees the inequality and sees like the... Um, you know the the real misfortunes that are that uh, people of color experience uh, every day in reality television, whether you're working behind the scenes or whether you're in front of the camera. Um, so it's uh, I think it's a matter of really uh, of sticking together and staying true to who you are and um, standing up for what you believe in and standing up for your rights and and never compromising. I feel like if we waver, um, then that's when our power is taken away from us. It's it's a uh, it's really put things in perspective that if we want change to occur, we, we need to reclaim our own power, unapologetically so. Hi. Um, Hi, what's your name? My name's Lee. Hi, Lee, you're beautiful. You're, you're, <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> you're beautiful too. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's an honor for both of you guys to be up here and congratulations on season two. Thank you. I wanted to ask, with what you were speaking about earlier, as far as like a younger you, what would you like to give back to your, young, your younger self, for those growing up in this next generation, and what's next for you, or what do you see for yourself coming up next? Um, a younger me, I mean, I think this is gonna sound really cliche when I say this, but I would, you know, if I could give advice to a younger me, it would be relax, just chill out, stay true to who you are, and everything will work out right. Also, you're right. I spent so much of my, of my um, formative years thinking that I was wrong or being told that I was wrong um, you know, for things that were far beyond my control, whether it was the color of my skin or my sexual orientation, trying to adjust myself to fit into certain molds or certain communities of people where I never felt like I quite belonged, and that's okay. You know, um, that's a huge that's a huge thing for you. For if if I could if I could pass that along to anybody who's going through puberty, growing up, coming into the, coming into themselves, don't compromise who you are. Don't try to change who you are, adjust who you are to try to please other people. Stay true to who you are. Those are the people that end up being the most fascinating people with the most interesting stories to tell. Um, you know, they become they you really really get to know yourself, and there's such power in that. Um, and then what's coming up next? Um, Hopefully, doing more more stuff like this. I love acting. I love working on Unreal. I think it's so, like it's my dream job. Not just acting, but working on a, this show specifically. I love, loved Marty Noxon, uh, who is the co-creator of Unreal. She worked on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, since, I've loved her since I was like 14, 15 years old, and working with her was such a specific goal of mine. And I can't even really tell you why, but since I was like 14, watching the credits roll up uh, at the end of each episode of Buffy, I would see her name and I would say, I'm gonna work with you one day. I, I don't know, I just, I just saw her the other night at the Peabody Awards and still to this day, whenever I see her, and I know her, she's a friend, but I, I see her and I get chills and I, like, I wanna cry every time I see her just because she's changed my life so dramatically. She's made my dreams come true. 
Um, so to be able to be that for, for somebody else, I think that's what's next. Um, I modeled for many years. Modeling was a means to an end. Uh, uh, modeling, modeling was a way to, to step into the world of acting. Acting is a, is a way for me to step into the world of activism and philanthropy and um, you know, just sh sharing my story and hopefully inspiring others to, 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 to live their stories um, as authentically as they can. That's the last one. Hi, Jeffrey. Hi, um, what's your name? I'm Jackie. Hi, Jackie. I was wondering what's the best piece of advice you ever got from your mom? Ooh, from my mom. I actually have a, that's a good, Ooh. that's a good question. <laughs> um, I actually have a tattoo on my wrist in my mother's handwriting that says surrender. Um, I got it when I was living in South Africa years ago. Um, but my, I, I, I'm a little bit of like an A-type control freak, spaz, if you will. Um, I've really had to learn over the years just to relax and chill out. And I always remember my mother saying to me when I was, uh, when I was growing up, Jeffrey, just go with the flow, just relax. I felt like I was always um, swimming upstream and really going against the grain, like what I spoke to before, just trying to fit myself into uh, boxes that I was, f that I just didn't fit. Um, so to have to have learned that and to have really internalized that and to have um, you know found a way to interpret it into into making it make sense for me. What that means, what that means for me, surrendering and going with the flow, just going with the flow of life. I go with, I go towards what makes me feel good. If something feels bad, I don't go that way. If you know, if I'm around a certain energy or a certain group of people that make me that make me feel not good about myself, or um, I can see them, you know, putting other people down or whatever it is, the, is the if the vibrational frequency is low, that's not a vibrational frequency for me. I tend to try to stay up here. I try, I try to stay lifted and, st and stay high and elevated. I try to elevate the people around me. And that, in, I mean, that's just, that's, that's the story of life, like attracts like. So if you are vibrating up here, you're only going to attract people in, in situations um, that, that, that match your vibrational frequency. So surrender and go with the flow is the best advice my mother ever gave me. Amazing, such an honor to be here. Congrats on season two, I can't wait to see Thanks, it. Thanks, Janet. Thank you so much for this. Thanks, guys. This was so much fun.